Welcome to the Security Speakeasy Show, where we will talk about all things network security. Today, we're discussing command and control, what it is, how it works, and how you can protect your organization from these types of attacks. My name is Melody Nori, Product Marketing Specialist at Palo Alto Networks. And today I'm joined by my colleague and industry expert, Craig Stansel. Craig, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Craig Stansel. I'm a senior product manager here at Palo Alto Networks uh, for threat prevention and advanced threat prevention. Thanks, Craig. So today's topic is all about one of the most critical steps in the attack lifecycle, command and control, also known as C2. With malicious and advanced attacks on the rise, it is important to have an understanding of how command and control works what attackers can accomplish through C2, and how organizations can protect themselves. Craig, could you please get us started by explaining what command and control is? Uh, sure. So <clears throat> to provide some context, and you kind of hit the nail on the head, a successful attack is not a single monolithic event, right? There's a series of things that the attacker has to accomplish in order for their attack to be successful. Uh, and sort of the tail end, one of the last activities there is command and control. And command and control essentially is when, you know, the compromise host or, or, or whatever endpoint that the attacker was able to compromise attempts to reach back out to their infrastructure. Um, and they can do that for a number of different reasons. So why is disrupting command and control so important? Oh, it's incredibly important. So, <clears throat> it, you know, def defense and depth aside, um, Command and control is sort of the last piece of that chain of events, and it represents sort of your last, your last opportunity to thwart that attack. Um, it's very important because that channel, that command and control channel, is how an attacker sends instructions, you know, back to the malware that's that's on the compromised endpoint. It can also be how they exfiltrate your data. So, if I were to successfully compromise you, that command and control channel is how I would steal your, you know, list of credit card numbers or social security numbers or whatever that case is. So, are we seeing examples of this today? Maybe. If you can recall a recent case where command and control was used in a real life scenario. Absolutely. So a good example that probably everybody is painfully aware of happened at uh, sort of the beginning of this year with the log4j uh, vulnerability. Uh, log4j is, is a vulnerability. It's actually, you know, that occurs earlier in the attack life cycle. But how a command or how an adversary would use that is they would use that log4j vulnerability to compromise an end host, download a secondary payload, and then establish that command and control out. And we saw that repeatedly in, in cases where you know, that attack was successful. Great, thanks so much for sharing that example. Yeah. So what are some of the biggest challenges that customers are facing with this type of issue? Basically, I mean, the big challenge is, you know, just the evolving tools and threat landscape. So traditionally, um, you could, detect and block command and control using like a traditional IPS signature based approach. There's a couple of big problems with that though. The first is that somebody somewhere has to be compromised. They have to realize they've been compromised and they have to capture that traffic. Only then can you write a signature to detect it. And that's not vendor specific, right? That gap exists regardless of who's writing that signature. You know, whether it's Palo Alto Networks or whether you're writing it yourself using, you know, Snort or Circata. So that's a pretty big, you know, security gap. Somebody has to have suffered in order for you to gain that protection. The other piece is over the last few years, uh, there's been a proliferation of tools that were specifically built to evade traditional IPS, you know, signature based approach uh, detection and prevention. Uh, tools like Cobalt Strike, for example. <clears throat> and these tools were originally written for legitimate uses, right? These are for uh, originally intended for teams to use to test their own security stack. Um, but as it happens, right, these tools fall into the hands of nefarious actors or bad actors. Um, so we're faced with this uh, additional challenge where, you know, the same tool might use different command and control types so that a signature-based approach uh, doesn't work very well, right? We call this elusive or evasive uh, command and control. So those two, uh, two main challenges that customers face today present a, a pretty big problem when it comes to stopping command and control. Right, and as you mentioned, you know, as the attack surface continues to 
increase and these hack tools are becoming more available to uh, malicious actors, how can organizations protect themselves? Well, with C2 specifically, um, you have to start looking at approaches that go beyond the traditional signature based approach, right? So, uh, you know, for example, you know, here we've developed advanced threat prevention. Uh, the idea there is we want to be able to detect C2 that's just that new, nobody's ever seen before. And we do that with, you know, deep learning models, machine learning. Um, but in a broader context, you have to understand, you know, the defense in depth is still very much an effective way to thwart these things because that a successful attack is a series of things that an attacker has to get right and has to be successful at in order to accomplish their objective. Um, things like zero trust or things like, you know, layer, layering protections become incredibly important. So, you know, for C2 specifically, you know, we want to start taking a look at non-signature driven approaches. But even before C2 happens, you know, if you have a DNS security product that will block name resolution for a, you know, a malware domain or a newly registered domain, you don't have, you don't even get to the C2 portion. And if you work backwards, um, those products or those, those uh, functions can <clears throat> progressively stop attacks at earlier and earlier stages. So, you know, pre, pre DNS even, you know, if you, your gateway AV blocks the download of the malware, then, you know, you've successfully thwarted that attack. Um, if the, the download goes through, if your endpoint prevents execution of that malware, you never get to the point where it tries to reach out. And you can kind of follow that chain all the way back through the initial, you know, exploit that's used to gain access to the system. Right. So you could say that command and control is your last opportunity to really stop that attack before something bad happens like data exfiltration or ransomware. It really is. And the advantage there, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of timeliness. So even if every single step along the way, the attacker is successful, if you manage to stop that C2 channel, uh, then it's essentially been all for naught. I mean, not necessarily, there's some lateral movement and stuff they can do within your network. But, you know, from a data exfiltration perspective, um, the command and control perspective, you've been able to sort of chop, chop it off right there at the end. Great. Well, thanks so much, Craig, uh, for joining us at Security Speak Easy to talk about command and control and how organizations can protect themselves against these attacks. If you like today's episode, hit the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment below. To learn more about advanced threat prevention, visit paloaltonetworks.com. Thanks so much for tuning in and see you in the next episode.